We're going to spend the next, the next five, can you hear me now? Okay. We're going to spend the next five Sundays in the Gospel of John. We've been with Mark for months. We're going back to Mark after these five weeks. And we're very intentionally spending the next six weeks, the next five weeks, on this chapter six of the Gospel of John. And so it seemed to me what the essence of today's piece of that chapter was, was this kind of first communion that we have in this miracle of feeding the multitudes. It is the only miracle that appears in all four Gospels. And then by the end, when the disciples all get heebie-jeebie again in fear, not that that ever happens to me or to us, we have that presence again coming from and through this communion experience and being with us and forming us into the beloved community. And that's what this is about. And we've sort of been prepared for this by the last um, last, by last week's scripture passage, which was one from Mark, and that was about, uh, we talked about last week, it was a passage about compassion and about miracles. And in that, Caroline Lewis had said, and you remember this, I'm sure, that compassion is not just a feeling, but a doing. And so, that's going to kind of see into what, what today's reading is, even though it's from John. And Nancy Rockwell reminded us that miracles require hope. <coughs> miracles require hope. And we're going to talk about that as we look at this passage a little more closely. We can also think about our own little miracle here, Faith, Family, United Church of Christ and see how that works for us. And the last person I want to remind us that we talked about last week was Alice McKenzie who wrote, see what happens with a little when the power of God is behind it. Remember that? See what happens with a little when the power of God is behind it. Can you see how those comments made about last week's scripture passage from Mark seem to inform us about this passage we're hearing here in John's Gospel. I want to look at a little bit of the uh, chapter before what Linda read. And it says, after this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Remember he had said last week, in last week's scripture, come away, let's rest, we've all been working really hard. Remember the disciples had come back from teaching and preaching and healing and they were telling Jesus all about what he had done. And he said, well, let's get away for a little bit. And as they're trying to get away for a little bit, the crowd moves in on him and so many are sick and so many need his compassion that he stops the rest he was going to have and he has compassion and heals them. And that's what they see. And John talks about that. Jesus went up to the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Well, that's what they got to sit down. You know, so when the pastor said, can you come into my office? I want to see you. We just need to have a sit down. Don't get nervous. <coughs> Don't get nervous about that. That's a good thing. As long as Jesus is there, it's a good thing. <laughs> when he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? Remember, it sounded a little bit different last week in Mark. He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. 
Philip answered, six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. That's the practical part of us, right? That's the practical part of us. So then Andrew goes up to Jesus and says to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. Do you hear the hope? Do you hear the lack of pessimism, the lack of practicality? <coughs> this isn't going to work. We can't make this work. We only got five loaves and two fishes and these thousands of people. And Andrew has a different response. But then playing in the back of his head, maybe, is what Philip had already said, because he follows that with, but what are they among so many people? See how easily we can discourage one another? How easily can we encourage one another? It doesn't take a whole lot from any one of us to make someone else's day, whether in here or beyond this community. If you did that this week, you know what I'm talking about. It doesn't take a whole lot of encouragement from any one of us to make someone's day. On Thursday, some of us went over to this little house in Ebor. <laughs> when I got there, Mary Zuba was there by herself with Julian <laughs> and his friend Jeff. And then Michelle came, Mary was with me, uh, Bev Barber came. Did Char come? Did she make it later or no? No, they were made. No. And we started encouraging Julian to paint faster. <laughs> <laughs> and he painted like a little demon with 17 paintbrushes in his two hands. He went nuts. <laughs> as did Mary and Michelle and Mary and Beth. And they sent me off to the corner by the front door <laughs> to paint the little stuff because it took patience for that. <laughs> I won't say how it felt to watch Julian go over and repaint. <laughs> Just a second coat. <laughs> But I will say there was no paint on those glass panes that I had put there when I was done. There was, there was paint, but it wasn't for me. <laughs> a little tiny bit of encouragement. And you know what? We all had a great time. We all had a great time. Yes. Thank you. That's just one example. I know there are other things each of you all did this week. I know this. Because I'm the pastor. <laughs> I know there were other things you did, tiny things, that gave somebody else hope. That encouraged somebody, and in giving that person hope, you planted the seed of a miracle that will happen for that person. You did that. Don't raise your hand if you did it. You all did that. It's about being mindful of the little things. Just the little things. All right, now, Frederick Buchner in his book, Telling the Truth, the Gospel as Tragedy, Comedy, and Fairy Tale. Don't you love the title? <laughs> Describes why truth telling is hard. I just told you a truth. I believe that's a truth. And he says this, before the gospel is good news, it's just news. Before the gospel is good news, it's just news. What makes it good news? What makes it good news? What makes this news 
of feeding all these people on this grassy plain with five barley loaves and two fishes, what changes it from news to good news? Optimism. I think a couple of things. One I think is Jesus' presence. You know, and Jesus' presence in our hearts as well as Jesus' presence for those disciples. And the other thing is that Jesus tells us what it is we're supposed to do as disciples, just as he tells those disciples what it is they're supposed to do. And so what does he say to them? Anybody remember? Make the people sit down. Do you know how hard that is on a family Sunday dinner? <laughs> Make the people sit in. Because we're about to have this little miracle that we call communion. We're about to have an experience here with all these folks where in each heart we're going to plant some hope. We're going to feed those bodies and we're going to plant some hope. And it's going to make a world of difference to those people. If you listen to the last prayer in the prayer of the people today, it was about two parents in here planting hope. And we're going to wait to hear how tiny miracles grow from that hope. That's our job. As the disciples, our role is not to think we're in control of it. We're not. Jesus is in control. All our job is to try to get the people to sit down so Jesus can talk to them and feed them. And right now that means through us. Frederick Buechner goes on to say, Communion is of the character of truth. For when we come to the table of our Lord, we come to God, we come on God's terms, not ours. Christ comes to us in communion first to say no to our desire to be in control. No to the people we wish we were, or we wish everyone thought we were. For most of us, it might be the second of those two so that we might then hear Christ's yes to the person we actually and already are. We tend to spend a lot of time in two places. One is the past, and we fret over what can't be changed there. The other is the future, and we fret over what hasn't happened and probably won't. And sometimes we miss the ducks on the pond because we're not in the present. You all read the pastor's message this week about the ducks on the pond, right? It went out late last night. But it was about a mother duck taking care of the baby ducks, watching them, caring for them the best she could with her little duck brain. And there was one gimping duckling. And this morning when I walked Noah, he hadn't been taken by the turtles on the pond. He was still there. They were swimming across the pond. He was behind everybody else. But his mother was between the gang of his siblings and him. She never lost sight of them, just like God never loses sight of us. God says yes to the person we already are. We don't have to try to fix ourselves. We don't have to live into somebody else's expectation of who we could be. Each of us created in God's image. Each of us. Called to be in communion with Jesus 
who will feed us and give us hope. And with one another, as we make way for all to sit down to be with Jesus. And when we do that, we feel that presence among us. David Luz says, what is difficult about communion is very simple. We had and have nothing to do with it. It is God's action of grace alone, so we can neither take credit for it nor control it. But this is also what is so crucial about our sacraments. For precisely because they are God's work and not our own, we can trust them. For now, when all else fails, our relationships or our sources of security our health, or even life itself, when we fail, yet God's promise stands firm. God's word to us in communion remains faithful, calling us ever back to who we really are in God's eyes. Feel this. This is a description of you. God's beloved and holy children. That's who we are. Not just who we're called to be, it's who we are. It's how God sees us. <coughs> and there are only six more pages of notes, plus the rest of chapter six to get to. <laughs> <coughs> Alice McKenzie also talks about the same line, make the people sit down. <coughs> and she says, with that command, reminds the disciples of what their job description is. To mind the gap between the five loaves and two fish and food for all. I think that's what the mother duck on the pond does. She minds the gap. That's what we're called to do, to mind <coughs> the gaps. It is not a question whether there will be a meal. Their job is to make the people sit down and to distribute the meal that Jesus provides. The disciples' job is to factor Jesus into any challenging situation they may face and to count on his presence from now on. That's our job. <coughs> factor in Jesus in all the challenging, all the difficult, paint jobs we'll ever have in life, whatever that paint job is. Factor Jesus into whatever it is you are doing. And then know that Jesus is there, present, and ready to help. I thought a lot about communion and beloved community this week. And I thought more and more about difficult situations in the past couple of weeks. Not ours, but others. <coughs> I thought about a situation in Chattanooga, Tennessee last week. I thought about Gunnery Sergeant Thomas Sullivan, <coughs> of whom it was said, through his tours of duty, he sought to bring stability to corners of the globe too often visited by senseless violence. I thought about Lance Corporal Squire K. Wells, also known as Skip. Of whom it was said, Skip is the kind of kid you want on your team. If you had a team, you'd want 20 Skips. I thought about Staff Sergeant David Wyatt. Because of his love for the Chattanooga community and their outpouring of support during this time, his family has chosen to lay him to rest in Chattanooga National Cemetery with full military honors. I thought about Sergeant Carson Holmquist on whose Facebook page his kids wrote, We miss you, Daddy. 
and about whom his close friend Ian Gavria said, there are few people I would say this about, but I would have trusted him with my life and my entire family's life without a single hesitation. I thought about Petty Officer Randall Smith, who saw the shooter, warned the people around him, and did not get away. I thought about the people in the Lafayette, Louisiana movie theater. Emily Mann says, you hear one loud shout and you're sure that's not what it is because it would never be that. And then you hear another and another and another and you realize that those aren't just lights and sounds. High school English teacher Allie Martin, suffering from a gunshot to the kneecap, made her way to a fire alarm and pulled it. Police say she saved lives, alerting some 300 people in the giant multiplex that something wasn't right. Man said of the situation, it was so difficult to comprehend that she didn't scream. After the first shot, you could hear people saying, what? What was that? She dropped to the ground, scrambled to the exit on her hands and knees, leaving behind a shoe and her purse. As she ran through the movie theater to the parking lot, she could hear people yelling that there was a shooter inside. Amid and among the chaos, high school English teacher Allie Martin and librarian Gina Mao were credited with helping to save lives. Mia, who was shot in the leg, told her colleagues that Martin, who was shot in the knee, still managed to pull the fire alarm. You know, I don't know if I would have done that. I don't know if I would have been that smart. I don't know if I would have been that courageous. I don't know if I would have been that other focused, but I am so glad for her example of discipleship in a movie theater of all places. The two women who were killed were 21-year-old Macy Bro and 33-year-old Jillian Johnson. Bro's body was brought to the same hospital where she was prepared to become a radiology technician. Johnson ran clothing and art boutiques, played in a rock band, and planted fruit trees for neighbors and the homeless. Difficult situations. The disciples' job is to remind people that the Jesus factor is at work, that Jesus is with us even at the most difficult times. I went to a website because I wanted to see what was happening in our first responders community, particularly police officers. And I found two stories. One of Sergeant Scott Lunger, who was shot and killed while conducting a traffic stop. The article reads, Sergeant Lunger observed a vehicle driving erratically. As he and another officer approached the vehicle, an occupant opened fire, killing him. He had served with the Hayward Police Department in California for 15 years and is survived by his two daughters. In New Orleans, police officer Vernal Braun succumbed to injury sustained five days earlier when struck by a car while investigating a car fire. He was training two police recruits at the scene of the vehicle fire, and two other vehicles were involved in a crash on an adjacent roadway. One of the vehicles veered off the road and struck him. He was transported to a local hospital where he remained in a coma until the other day. Brown had served with the New Orleans Police Department for 17 years and is survived by five children in this families. There are so many places in our world where we need to be the disciple that steps into the gap and helps people through those moments. In Tampa, Florida, a 
25-year-old transgender woman was found beaten to death on Tuesday morning. The young woman, India Clark, was described by family <coughs> as a very loving person. Mom, I love you. Dad, I love you, were her last words before leaving the house, according to her mother, Bella. Initial reports have stated that Clark was a man in a dress. And the Hillsborough County spokesman, Larry McKinnon, said they would not be categorizing Clark as transgender. We are not going to categorize him as transgender. We can just tell you he had women's clothing on at the time. Well, guess what? Since then, he's been categorized, she's been categorized as transgender. On Friday night, there was a vigil. I was intending to go to it, but assumed because of the weather and having heard reports that <coughs> people in the county had been asked to stay off the roads, it would be canceled. It wasn't. So on Friday night, there was a vigil. <coughs> a candlelight vigil was held for India Clark, who was killed outside the Tampa Community Center. More than 100 people filled Gaslight Park in downtown Tampa in Clark's memory. This is what her mother said. I know she had a lot of friends, but I didn't know she had this many. This really makes me happy that she really had a lot of friends that loved her. These people, Sergeant Thomas Sullivan, who was 40, Corporal Squire Wells, who was 21, Sergeant David Wyatt, 35, Sergeant Carson Holmquist, 25, Petty Officer Randall Smith, 26, Macy Brown, 21, Jillian Johnson, 33, Scott Lunger, 48, Vernell Brown, 47, and India Clark, 25. Not to mention two-year-old Ethan Adams, who was found in his pond, family pond, the other day uh, here in Donnell. These are all folks who encountered those difficult spaces that today's scripture leads us to believe we all need to be aware of. One more, Sandra Bland from Houston, Texas, was 28. And we await to hear what really happened in her jail cell. So much and this is just in our tiny little corner of the world. We're not a nation in crisis in terms of there's a civil war here, there is drought here and famine here, people dying from disease here because we don't have the drinking water throughout the country. We don't have those massive issues. But we have issues where because of the blessed communion that we know, we learn as disciples to stand in the gap, 